Coming up on this week's Outdoor Elements. On today's Outdoor Elements, we'll visit Rum Village Nature Center. We'll investigate moths and learn about a new online resource that can help you identify and share your discoveries. We'll also check out some native spiders to our area and learn how they hunt. But first, we'll find a new way to play in the outdoors. Outdoor Elements is presented in partnership with the St. Joseph County Parks Department, Cardinal Native Plant Nursery, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, and the Indiana State Parks. Carla Gull at Rum Village Nature Center. And we met at the Nature Center here a long time ago, and I know you have a passion for getting people outdoors. And specifically, you've done a lot of work on getting kids outdoors and how to make the, the play that they do when they're outdoors really meaningful. So what are some things that people can do to make that, that play meaningful when the kids are outside? Okay, so one aspect that I do is called loose parts play. So there was a guy named Simon Nicholson in the 70s kind of coined this, and he said, in any environment, both the degree of inventiveness and creativity and the possibility of discovery are directly proportional to the number and kinds of variables in it. So just being able to play with stuff and being bored enough to play with stuff is really important for kids. And we've kind of moved to where we're really kind of overscheduled mm -hmm. on electronics and having some time to be bored and just play is essential. Yeah, so sometimes, sometimes there's a little too much structure in the play yeah. and we need to take some of that structure out and let the kids do their thing, right? Yeah, definitely. And you know, I know Carla, you've got, um, you, you have a doctorate in education, you do lots of uh, activities with kids, etc. How does the environment that you in, are in uh, work with the loose play? Like, what can you do loose play indoors, outdoors? Does it matter? It doesn't matter. You can do it anywhere. Richard Louvre actually kind of talked about that. And he said, you know, a loose parts toy, as Nicholson defined it, is open-ended. Children may use it in many ways, combine it with other loose parts through imagination, creative, creativity. He said nature, which excites all the senses, remains the richest source of loose parts. I like it outdoors, though we do plenty of indoor stuff as well, just because the mess isn't as messy if it's <laughs> <Yeah>. outside. <laughs> yeah. A lot and easier to clean up sticks when you're surrounded, surrounded by, by sticks, sticks already, right? Yeah. Yeah. And nature affords so many yeah. loose parts loose as it parts. is. And mm -hmm. if you think about sticks, how many different things can a stick be? Mm -hmm. If a child picks it up, yeah. they are riding with it, it becomes a wand, it becomes a horse. There are so many different things. A lightsaber. Yes. All yes. Kinds all of it becomes things. a yeah. building instrument. They make their forts out of it. So sticks can be so many things. It's actually in like the Toy Hall of Fame because a stick is so important. Oh, no that kidding. That makes perfect sense, yeah. yeah. Wow, that's There's, great. We're surrounded by all kinds of toys out here. We yes, are. if you look around, I yeah. mean, there, there are, are so many opportunities that are afforded in the outdoors that we can just find wherever we are. Right. Sometimes I bring other tools and stuff along with us, but we can just play with nature. Well, it looks like you brought, that's a great segue, because yep. it looks like you brought a lot There's of stuff, stuff that we're going to get to play with, right? <laughs> so you want to talk us through some activities so that Vince and I can, like, uh, play. Start play? Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I brought some stuff. This would, this is stuff that I just brought to the beach with us last week. But just some buckets and funnels and shovels and um, colanders and strainers, any of those kinds of things. So I brought some water tubs, and I use this either with water and or with soil dirt right, as here. well. Yep. And mm -hmm. I even just he leave like a pot with tools like this on the front porch so we can grab and go and if I am using someone else's dirt I do check to make sure when I go places like is it okay if we use some of your dirt we'll make sure we put it back clean mm -hmm. or I just bring dirt with us okay if we need to do Great. that too so okay. um, I like to bring a water carrier um, so I've got some water that's available especially when I'm doing programming things mm -hmm. but lots of times even the hose in the backyard works well for that and so you want to try yeah. I want to yeah. I want to like okay. make I'm grab gonna something make, okay. I'm gonna make <laughs> mud pies uh, excellent with this. <laughs> I want to see what is in this mud. Oh, well, obviously you are the like scientific well, guy. <laughs> I'm going to make some art or something. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Even so, just experimenting to see what what happens with different tools is really interesting for children. Do you find, Carla, that uh, does it matter? Little kids, older kids, do they react differently? Uh, it depends. I think that younger children are sometimes 
more used to play and they're willing to go explore it a little bit more. Oh, that's um, interesting. Some uh, older children feel like they need permission to play yeah. because they've been told no, no. so often. Yeah. Or don't get dirty, yes. right? Exactly. It, or they've been given structure in so many different environments. They Sometimes they need the coaxing on how to operate without the structure, without the structure. sometimes it seems. Yes, exactly. So all those kinds of things. You're oh, finding all kinds of neat things. look at <laughs> that. Oh, that. And then sometimes, you know, if I'm, especially in my own space or a place where I know they're going to mow sometime soon, I might even go look around and see if there's something in nature that's okay that's fallen on the ground or might be used to add in more embellishments to that. Right. And children are well versed in this. Um, if they've been given the opportunity, opportunity. and time to do yeah. it. So. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Make some dinosaur tracks. Yeah. Oh, that's a great idea. Study some tracks. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. 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 So cool. water and dirt, soil, um, even sand, all of those yep. are different substrates that are great for play. Okay. And, and I love that this is something that we can do at home. We don't have to go anywhere special to do yeah. it, but we can um, have a pot like this with dirt or sand and, in it. And there's really no cost. No, right. I, I yeah. mean, this is stuff that people gave me or got at garage sales or yeah. I just decided I didn't need any more. Yeah. <laughs> Literally loose parts that yes. are around, right around. around the yep. home. Yep. Okay. All that right. Hey, what else can we do? Yep. That was fun. Yeah. Okay. So we are actually going to use some of that mud there. Oh, okay. Why don't you put a little bit of water in there just to make it a little bit uh, stickier. Yeah. Ooh. And not too but soupy, but just like where soupy. you can mold it. Right. That's good, probably. Okay. Okay. Bet. So another option, a starter, I guess we'd say, is just making faces with nature. Oh, uh, yeah. So I, I brought my own basket of stuff today, but um, lots of times we'll just find what's in nature. So I've got some tree cookies. I've got some flowers and some rocks, some sweet gumballs, some acorn caps, and um, all kinds of different things like that. Ooh, um, just wasn't sure, you know, what we'd have available. Mm -hmm. So brought some starters, and you can take the mud and actually make your own mud blob face. You can put it on the tree oh. and make a face with it. Um, I also use clay or play dough, or even let's see, like or a even in like a oh, and like a, a frame, frame or or, uh, or even your little cake, right your like cake this. skillet, right? Yeah. So right. you can just think about what a face would include and add eyes and noses and smiles or frowny faces, any kinds of emotions that you might want to do with oh, that. Oh, fun! So are yeah. you gonna want some of this mud? Oh yeah. Well, I'm gonna try one on the side of the tree. Oh, great! And, and you've got like some kind of play-doh there, right? Yeah, this is just homemade play-doh. Uh -huh. I also will just use natural clay, and that's something that I don't mind leaving out with homemade play-doh. I usually will clean it off afterwards because I don't want to leave that out in nature. But I can just take bits of nature and kind of glue it. Oh, look at that! Right, it sticks on right there. on there. Yeah. That's amazing. Yours is very colorful. Yeah. I kind of had like off. the mono, mono chrome. Oh, you got like, yeah, like yeah. a little goatee yeah, there, right? Yeah, exactly. A little goatee hanging That's on awesome. Side there, I guess. Very cool. There Sometimes Fun. I see like little tongues sticking out, just yep. whatever it may be. So, oh, yeah. great. With awesome. um, larger groups, I'll even get the big frames out, Excellent. and then we can work together oh, on one collaborative a, a project. A composite as well. picture. Yeah. Great. Well, we've done a lot of different kinds of things here. We made some some mud muffins and we've got some faces and you know <laughs> and you gave us a simple instruction but it looked turned into such different things yes. here and i think that's one mm -hmm. of the great things about it mm -hmm. so thanks a lot for showing us all these things i think we'll try to find an opportunity to use these in some programs soon and we're gonna share information about your website and the resources you have inside outside michiana mm -hmm. on the outdoor elements website so thanks so much carla yes thank you glad to be here Rum Village Nature Center is known for its oaks and it has several different kinds. You can tell a couple of different classes of oaks by the leaf shape and I've got some here. Anything that's in the white oak family has rounded lobes with no bristles on the tips. Anything that's in the black and red oak family has tiny little, they're not sharp, but tiny little points or bristles on the tips. So next time you're hiking in the woods with oaks and acorns, take a look at the leaf shapes to try to determine what kind of oak you're looking at. Well, we're here at Rum Village Nature Center and I found this cool moth and it, I'm not really able to identify it really well. It's pretty tricky to identify this thing. There's a lot of moths and some of them are pretty challenging to ID and I'm here with Steve Sass who knows a lot about moths and who has helped me try to find an identity for this and who has done some cool work on moth identification in general. What can you tell me about this moth? 
This is a moth that actually most people would recognize more in the caterpillar phase. It's an Isabella tiger moth, and in its larval form, we call it the woolly bear okay, moth. Okay, so that's the one we see like in the fall, crawling across to the brown and the black, and it's all fuzzy? Exactly. They're a lot more uh, commonly identified in the fall when they're, when they're the fuzzy caterpillars. Some yeah. people use them as a, a means of, uh, of identifying whether it's going to be a long winter. Or yeah, a, if it has more form. of one color or the other, yeah. But this particular moth, uh, a lot of these moths are sort of the sparrows of the insect world, the, the little brown moths, and they can be very challenging to identify. But you've put together a resource you're part of the evolution of a resource that's really helping people with this thing. I've seen a lot of moth books, but there are a lot of moths, a lot more moths than people realize. And so you've put something together, an online resource. What can you tell me about that? There are. Well, first of all, as far as being a lot of moths, uh, butterflies are in the same order of Lepidoptera as moths. And butterflies typically get all of the credit because they're, they're typically uh, showier and they yeah, fly during colorful. the day and people know them. What people don't realize is that for every one butterfly, there are approximately 10 different moths. Wow. So the resource that I put together uh, began as a part of our Facebook group, which is called In Nature, or I-N Nature. And um, we, we, we quickly realized that we were getting lots of different wonderful photos of of moths and butterflies from around the state and, and a lot of people didn't know what they were. And so we created a project and we called it the Great American Indiana Nature Lepidopter Project where we encouraged folks to take pictures of um, butterflies and moths that were flying around maybe in their neighborhoods that they uh, wanted to um, have an identification yeah. on or maybe just wanted to help contribute um, to education. And so from those photographs we started building web pages and we created a website which is indiananature.net yeah. and we have a lot of different um, moth and butterfly pages that we're creating for, um, for the website. So what kind of discoveries and what kind of things have you found for the, the GAIN LP project? So we've been doing this for just over a year now and in that amount of time we have almost 700 people around the state of, the Indi of, state of Indiana who have been out um, taking photographs and posting observations of these moths. Out of those 700 observers, we have over 7,000 sightings of just under 1,100, 1100. species Excellent. that we've been able to, to ascertain. So out of those 1,100 species, we do have some moths and some butterflies that are um, fairly interesting. Yeah. Okay, this first moth is one called Heliozella acela and it actually doesn't have a common name. It's not a very common moth at all. That's really a mouthful, yeah. We need to come up with a common name for that thing. So yes, we remember well, we could. This is actually a moth that has not been reported in Indiana by either of the two major insect websites, Butterflies and Moths of North America or BugGuide.net. So this was one that was found by a contributor to the GAIN LP project, Brian Lowry, who Excellent. is an individual who has um, some health issues that have limited his mobility and he's not able to get out in nature as much as he used to be able to and this is a way that he stays very well connected and, and it's um, contributing to our knowledge of what's here now that's and excellent. he's done a wonderful job of contributing things this next picture that's is nice a butterfly thing. and this is the it's called the silvery blue butterfly this was found by another one of our observers and this one is a butterfly that has not been seen in indiana since the 1980s wow uh, one of our observers doug selzer found this in LaGrange County earlier this year. So this is a very significant sighting. So I see it's got some spots on it. It's kind of whitish, a little blue. Is it blue on the other side? Is that why they call it yes, blue? Yes, when, the, the, um, when, it, when it opens up, the top sides of the wings are blue. Got it. This third individual is another moth. This is called the showy emerald moth, and it has that wonderful green camouflage. If it lands on a leaf, you wouldn't necessarily uh, see it there. So this, this particular moth was found at the Indiana Dunes State Park a few weeks ago by the entrance to the Nature Center. And it's actually a specialist on poison ivy. So its caterpillars eat nothing but poison ivy and a couple of other things. While I was standing out there photographing this, one of the um, visitors to the park asked me how he could have this moth in his yard and my reply was the first thing you should probably do is Leave stop cutting down yep. the poison ivy or poisoning the poison ivy. So people always want to know, that. you know, what, what good is poison ivy? We've got some around us right here in the woods here right. and people are, get, get a lot frustrated with it. But it does have some value, it has some wildlife value. 
and uh, it might be food for something like this. Well, there are a lot of, probably a lot of other species that we could find around the woods here. So let's take a quick peek about along the trail here and see if there's any uh, moths or signs of moths that can tell us a little bit more about what's out here. Wonderful. Okay, so take a look here. While this isn't a moth, this gives us a very in good indication that a moth was here because we can see the chewing that yeah. has been done to the leaves. This is a hickory yep. uh, sapling. So or... something's been chewing on that right there. Exactly. Yeah. And it's very important when trying to attract native insects to have their respective host plants. And by host plant, what we mean is that insects tend to be very specialized eaters as larvae. So caterpillars can't eat everything the way that you and I can go to the grocery store and eat from a variety of things. They have to have very specialized food sources. And hickory, being a native tree, has evolved with these insects over the course of thousands of years. And it's something that a lot of different moth caterpillars are able to make use of. It's a really great so like a lot of people are familiar with the milkweed and that that's important for a monarch butterfly, yeah. but the other, the other species need things as well and they're very specific the, as the well. The monarch butterfly is kind of the poster child for insect specialization, yeah. but the fact is that most insects or most Lepidoptera caterpillars are specialists. Are specialists. And if we look down here, here's some, another grouping of leaves. These are oak leaves and we can also see that these have been chewed on quite a bit. There are a lot of things that eat oak leaves, right? There are. Oak is the number one uh, plant for supporting Lepidoptera yeah. in eastern North America. There are over 500 species of moths and butterfly caterpillars moths. that can eat oak leaves. So if you want wildlife, you got to plant an oak tree. And it's very important for birds, too. And studies have shown that the way that birds find their food, which is primarily caterpillars during this time of the year in June when they're raising young is by looking for the holes that are in the leaves and looking for the chewed up leaves. That tells them there's some food there. Great, exactly. let's keep looking for some more. Okay. So a building like this that has some lights on at night, it's a good place to look for moths sometimes because they'll get attracted to lights and end up on the building. We saw a cool one back there. What one was that one called? It was a pale beauty. A pale this beauty. all white moth. And there's some other cool ones around here. I saw some caterpillars, but this one, I really like this one right here. That is a gorgeous moth, isn't it? That one is called the tulip tree beauty. We have a lot of tulip trees around here, so you were saying, you know, about you have to have the right host plant, so we wouldn't have that if we didn't have the tulips. Exactly, as the name implies, it's a specialist yeah. on tulip trees, as well as some other trees, but native trees are extremely important to that moth, which camouflages itself like tree bark. Yep. Amazing adaptation. That's a really cool one. I, right here, against this background, it's, it stands out, but if it, that's on tree bark, I don't see how you could possibly even notice that one. And that's, so its, that's its survival yeah, method. Yeah, it's not going to be food for uh, birds as quickly. Well, if I didn't know that one and you weren't here, I'd probably have to go to the Gain LP webpage to learn what it was. Maybe it's on there already, or maybe I'd take a picture and contribute it. Thanks yep. for sharing about the website. Thanks for sharing and telling us a little bit about moths. That's great. Thanks for having me. If you're one of those folks that's a little nervous about spiders, then this segment might not be for you, but you might learn some things about several of our native spiders that are in this area. And we're with Connor Allison. And Connor, you actually, in college, did a capstone project on spiders, right? I did. How'd you get interested in spiders? Um, kind of randomly. I uh, was looking at different topics, and I had done uh, many other projects and written reports about insects and uh, stumbled upon something different but something that I fell in love with much harder. Awesome and specifically you really got into jumping spiders, jumping spiders right which yes. we're going to see one of in a minute but you brought several spiders and they're all a little different right mm -hmm. so I, let's start right off by I don't know pick one that we can kind of take okay. a look at we'll save the jumping spider for later but let's okay. pick one well, I'll pick this one and so if people are um, nervous about spiders and spider bites is this a spider that they might have to be concerned with? Oops. They, w you would not have to worry. <laughs> the mouth part of this spider is too small to hurt or bite you. Okay. Um, this is a cellar spider, common in almost every basement or shed. Um, they are what is truly known as daddy long leg, right. um, which is commonly confused with a harvestman that you find out in forests. And they differ by 
true spider is carnivorous, while the harvestman you'd find outside is a herbivore. And my recollection, because I have several of these cellar spiders in my basement, they don't really do an organized, what I would call orb web. Is that right? It's kind of a correct. It's um. It's kind of cobby, cobwebby. It is kind yeah. of cobby, and it really uh, just differs in uh, where you would see them place their web and what they would uh, expect to find. An orb web is usually more out in the open, and it's expecting to catch something that Flying will fly in, into right? it. Yeah. Okay. Um, good. Good point. Okay. All right, great. I love the little uh, stripes on the legs here, right? If you look yeah. really close at the joints, you can see those little kind of knobby knees, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to put this little one back. Very sweet. So people could look right in their basement for a cellar spider. Yeah. What else you got? I have a wolf spider. Oh, wolf spider. Now, wolf spiders can get big, right? They can get big. Um, we have... We, they have a, a whole range of sizes, so some that are about as small as about a, the tip of a pencil. Um, mm, okay. And then we have larger ones. This one is medium size. Yeah. Um, thicker body though, I mean right it's away you thicker can tell body. it's a thicker body, so the, the legs difference, are thicker. The difference from the one we saw previously to this one is this is an active hunting spider. Okay. So this one is out and about looking for its food, and you can see a difference in the sort of structure of its legs. They're not as long right. or tiny. Right. They're much thicker. Yep. And so this and would feed on what? You mentioned it would be an active this hunter. This would so. feed on mostly other insects. Okay. Um, and one difference with uh, the active spiders versus just ones that make web are the is the importance of eyesight um, and you'll usually find large forward facing eyes on the front of its face and usually um, the way the eyes are spaced on the head is very indicative of what they hunt okay. um, so this one has full 360 coverage Oh, for that, the eyes. For the eyes. Okay. But the forward facing eyes would have like the better focus while the other ones would be able to just pick up motion. Okay, like when something hits the web and they can see something bouncing. But this is actually not catching its prey in a web, no. right? So is that actually scouring um, around and looking for little insects to Yeah, chunk down? and not all spiders make webs. Right. They all lay silk. Mm -hmm. um, these spiders wouldn't lay a web, but they will wrap their eggs in a ah. silk casing right. for protection. Right. And I think you have something that's called an orchard spider that's kind of metallic looking in one of these containers. Oh. Uh, this is uh, an orb weaver, a uh, member of the long-jawed orb weaver family. Okay. And uh, So orb weaver meaning it will make one of those make, kind of round wagon wheel yes. kind of webs, right? To catch something that would be flying into it. Yes. Right? Yeah. Well, um, one of my favorite spiders is a jumping spider, which I know you said was kind of your specialty. And you've got one in one yeah. of these containers. To me, these are the teddy bears of spiders. Oh, yeah. They're, right? they're like kittens. <laughs> I'm thinking there's a bunch of viewers right now that are saying, I don't think so, Connor. But they are ador adorable, right? They're adorable. <laughs> and one thing that makes them so adorable is that they are have extremely flexible behaviors hmm. and it they're extremely intelligent now and, one um, thing that i think is fascinating about jumping spiders is they always look kind of fuzzy or hairy which is why yes. i called it like the teddy bear of spiders right but also you can see on a on this jumping spider i love it it's backing up right i love uh, you can see the eyes right yeah. so tell us about the eyes in a jumping spider and how they might be different from some of the others so, that we looked at like the wolf spider I showed, yep. it has large forward-facing eyes. These are much larger than the forward-facing eyes on the wolf spider, okay. and they have the highest um, visual uh, uh, ability huh. um, than other spiders. Um, they rely predominantly on their vision as well as their to hunt. Their scent, sense. Oh, okay. So they can do both. Yeah. yeah. And it, it's kind of like they give each other feedback. Um, when these guys hunt, they have 
um, the forward pair of eyes that have really good visual acuity. And then the other three sets of eyes pretty much make up motion detectors or motion analysis. And they hunt through looking for key attributes to their prey. I want to ask you too, um, this one in particular has this great little smiley face, which we can see in this wonderful resource here that you brought. And we're going to put on the Outdoor Elements website some uh, links to some of these great resources. If people want to learn more about spiders that are in our area, these are some good choices, right? So point is, if we learn more about them, we'll be less afraid. And Connor, thank you so much for sharing your enthusiasm about spiders. Thank you. Well, we've had great fun in this wonderful oasis, Rum Village yeah. Nature Center, pretty much downtown South Bend. Yeah, we made some mud pies and uh, mud cupcakes and yeah. faces and all kinds of cool things. <laughs> that was great. And of course, I got to see my favorite spider with Connor, the jumping yeah. spider. Like so the little cute. teddy bears of the spider world. So cute. Yeah. And I uh, got to learn about some moths and got a resource that maybe will help me identify some of the moths that I find that can be pretty challenging. So I think I'm looking forward to using that. All good stuff. Remember, you can find your own outdoor elements when you visit area parks and nature centers. We'll see you next time. For more information on this and other episodes, go to the Outdoor Elements website at wnit.org backslash outdoor elements. Catch up on recent episodes and find additional resources like hands-on activities and informational PDFs. It's one more way to help you find your own outdoor elements when you visit area parks and nature centers. Outdoor Elements is presented in partnership with the St. Joseph County Parks Department, Cardinal Native Plant Nursery, the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, and the Indiana State Park. Outdoor Elements is made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you.